All right, uh, we are finishing today how to be generous. Next week, I'm going to talk about just a standalone message, uh, the second death of Goliath. How many of you know David killed Goliath twice? Okay, good. And Mother's Day, we're going with it. Staff asked me, Monday, you're really not going to talk about the mother who circumcised her son on Mother's Day. I said, I sure am. <laughs> and you're going, how are you going to pull this off? You need to be here and find out. <laughs> right? Actually, the title is The Mother Who Saved Israel. You'll have to be here on Mother's Day. All right? So here we go. How to be generous. Luke 12. Luke 12, Luke 12. Verse 13, let me get there. Where are we at? Here we go. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. How many of you know there's some bad stuff going on in that family right there? Obviously, the older brother who was responsible for it, he wasn't cutting the check for the younger brother. That's bad news. I've seen families, obviously somebody died here, I've seen families divide over a pocket knife. Just the craziest stuff, you know. Uh, but he said to him, Jesus, man, who made me judge or arbitrary over you? Jesus said, I'm not executor of your will. If you've ever been executor of a will, or if you haven't, don't. I did one time. It was the worst thing ever. People were calling me names, and all my job was, was to execute this guy's will who died. I didn't make it up, and boy, they was calling me everything but George. Well, they did say George in there, but it was, I, I had, I, my job, Jesus said, that's not my job. But he did say to them, take care, be on guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Covetous. What is to covet? It means, I want what you got. Okay? And, uh, you, you know, back in, when I was a kid, and I'm about to reveal my age, we didn't have internet. We had three channels on TV, four, six, twelve, and that depended on what kind of tinfoil. <laughs> Some of you hear me now. You put on the rabbit ears, or if you were really upscale, you had the outside antenna that you had them go twist. Whoa! Back, back a little, right there. There wasn't a lot of, other than just human interaction, maybe at school or something, that you knew what people had. You, you know what I mean? You'd go to school and the kid would have a new pair of Nikes. And you go, oh, what is that? Those are Nikes. Oh, Nikes, cool. But, but today, I don't have my phone on me, but I, I don't have social media. Uh, today, how many of you know, you know everything about everybody? Too much about some people. I do stalk. I like getting on Marketplace, Facebook Marketplace. I just like looking at junk. But I do reach through there sometimes. I'm like, you know, some of these people, it's kind of like churches. If they'd get rid of their marquee and quit being tempted to put stuff on the sign, they'd probably grow. Some of these people need to get rid of social media because they put in what? We don't care about bodily functions gone bad. Or... So what happens now is, you know, even as kids that you have, they're able to look at someone else's life and want what they got because it's always on display, right? So it's easier. It's easier nowadays. Uh, I had to ask myself a question, and I told somebody this morning, when I preach to you, it's kind of like a mama vulture. A mama vulture chews, eats, and it spits it into her kid's mouth. I know that's horrible. That's a horrible analogy. But don't think I get up here and preach to you. Everything I say to you applies to me. Amen. Everything you struggle with, I struggle with. Amen. Okay? And if you're first time here, I'm a pastor who tries to be honest. Right? And so, why, why do I struggle when it comes to giving to the cause of the kingdom of God, but not when it comes to spending it on myself? Right? Uh, The best answer I could come up with was this. Most of the time, 
I find my identity and I find my security in the things I possess. And, and I don't find my identity in Christ. Okay. Uh, I probably need to talk about this once a year, and I don't. If you've never been here in five years, you've never even heard me talk about generosity, our gener generosity in our time with our talents and with our treasures. I mean, it's all important. I probably need to talk about this, but I'm gun shy on this. And uh, one of the players that has really blacked the eye of a local church, Mr. Benny Hinn, he came, he came clean this past week. I don't know if you heard this. He came out in the open and apologized and repented because he had been, been misleading people in this prosperity gospel saying if you give, God will heal, or if you give, God will da-da-da. Now, there is principles in giving. There's no scripture that I can see that says if you give, you know, here's what's going to happen. By my own personal experience, I do know God's blessings. I have lived a blessed life. Uh, I, look, I look at my generation, right, my generations, my mom's side, uh, I don't know anybody above my grandma and grandpa on that side, so I can't say. Uh, but my grandma and grandpa were very generous to the cause of God. Their life was blessed. They weren't rich in, in the eyes of what you think would be rich. They had everything they needed. They lived a comfortable life. They passed that to my mother. On my dad, he was the first one to practice generosity to the cause of Christ. Uh, and I, I looked at the two parallels, and I saw the blessings of God, okay? And I think that looks different. I, I can't tell you what that's going to be, but I can tell you what a blessed life looks like. I can tell you, you give me two family members, one who's generous, one who isn't, and I can, without you telling me, I can spend time with you and tell you which one, by asking a few questions, is generous to God, because I see the hand of God on that. Uh, we have been, the local church has got its eyes blacked by Creflo Dollar came out last year and said the same thing. I'm sorry, I've been preaching a false gospel. And, you know, they're made, they've made millions. And so what has happened is it's black, the eye of a local church like us who are trying to reach our communities. Right? Because we've seen this mess misused. So I want to preach and teach. I want to teach. I feel like kind of an old dad. I, I, told, I, I feel like an old dad. I guess I'm, I'm knocking on 60, so I can be an old dad. I see my schoolmates in here, people I graduated with. And, but we got here quicker than we thought, didn't we? <laughs> right? Uh, so I, I want to teach you a principle, and you will thank me one day, and you will really thank me on that day. I'll show you. All right. So, identity in Christ. Uh, I've learned, I've learned myself that uh, kind of my litmus test in me, what is in my heart at the time will be exposed by what I treasure, and, and the Bible tells me that, uh, because where my heart is, that's where my, my stuff goes, right, my, my, my resources uh, for instance, I have no problem spending money on books, Bibles, commentaries, study material. I got loads of it. Loads. I can't get enough. Yeah, I, I want that. But I have a very hard time spending money on clothes. I know that's not obvious. Had an Astro shirt on the other day, and I, I don't even keep up with them, but I hear they're doing horrible. Somebody goes, I can't believe you're wearing that shirt. I said, it was the least wrinkled. <laughs> That's how I judge things. Now, it used to be, when I was these guys' age, is it cool, you know what I mean? Now it's the other two Cs, cost and comfort. Is it cheap <laughs> and is it comfortable? Anyway, I, I have a hard time. Spending money on clothes, I have no problem. I have Bibles and Bibles. I love Bibles. I love commentaries. I love that kind of stuff. Uh, why is that? Why is that? Because my self-worth is based on what I know, not what I look like. I'm a pastor, a teacher. I find my identity 
I know, I'm, I'm being honest with you. I find my identity in what I know. Not what I look like. I don't really care about that. I got a wife that helps me, you know. <laughs> but that's where my identity, because that's what I do. That's where I find my fulfillment. You know, that, that, that's it. Uh, anyway, does that make sense to you? I've heard it said that money's an idol, but I know by my own life that it reveals my idols and what in my identity. Now, maybe you today listening online because nobody in first service falls under this category. Maybe you're listening online or maybe you're coming to second and you're peeking to find out if you want to come to second because that's what second service people do. They peek and go, I'm not coming. I'm not getting, I'm not shaving my legs for this. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> That's that old song, did I shave my legs for this? And it's not, not going to be on the gospel channel. You'll have to look at that somewhere else. Uh, maybe we hold tight to our possessions as a control mechanism. Uh, and here it is. I'm going to say this because th this is us. So that I'm self-sufficient and I don't have to rely on God in faith. Generosity is a faith issue, Right? Uh, and, and I had to say this, George, sometimes George is his own God, right? Maybe you live for your children. If you put all your time, your money, your effort into them, you're going to find it's hard to turn them loose at the right time. And trust me, you will want to turn them loose <laughs> at the right time. Uh-huh. What happens is our identity gets wrapped up in how they look or how they perform or, better yet, how others view them, right? And matter of fact, there's, there's parents in here today. Your kids are in their 40s and 50s, and you're still taking responsibility for their dumb actions. Let yourself up. That'd be a good Mother's Day message, wouldn't it? Let yourself up instead of what I'm talking about. These things demand our lives and ask everything of us. But you know something? Jesus is the only treasure that gave his life for us. Why come to earth when you had it all in heaven? Think about that. Why give up those riches? The only answer I can come up is we must be more precious to him than all the glory and splendor of heaven. Because he gave it all up for us. And we took part of a picture of what it took to pay for that. And aren't you glad he did? When we realize we are his ultimate treasure, do you know that you and I are his ultimate treasure? And what he gave up to get us, then that should, want, should make me to want uh, to be, you know, to make him my ultimate treasure. And when that happens, when that happens, and I, 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 I bumped up against it a few times there in my life, but I have to say I don't live there. When he's my ultimate treasure, that's my goal. George shows up most of the time. Or my alter ego, Greg. <laughs> I have an alter ego. His name's Greg. I try to keep Greg in the attic at the house, but sometimes Greg jumps in the car and I don't know it. You're like, I'm sorry I invited you. To... <laughs> this is not really our pastor. He's not here today. So, uh, Greg's here. Greg don't go to church. Greg don't go to church. Greg don't know Jesus. Greg's not generous. Okay. Greg's here. When we start turning our focus to make him our treasure, right? All of these other things in our lives just become things and not our identity. Then my possessions become a tool to change the world and grow his kingdom. Amen? So we're looking at how to be generous. And it's more than a random act of giving. And Jesus said, generous people... Or happy, blessed people. I've never met a generous person who was unhappy about his or her generosity. 
So let's get practical with this. Papa George, I'm going to talk to you today. <laughs> I'm going to help you with something I learned the hard way about. Okay? That's the only way I know to learn. A lack of generosity isn't a spending problem. A lack of generosity is a spiritual problem. Uh, why would I say that? Because our lack of generosity is fueled by worry. Worried because we have placed our trust in, in riches and things and people rather than in him who richly provides. Jesus says the antidote is generosity. Generous, generous people, right, don't assume it's theirs to consume all of it. And Jesus wants to know if it comes to us, doesn't necessarily mean it's all for us. Uh, somebody told me recently, we need to just go back to the book of Acts giving. That's where we need to start. I said, really? You want to go to the book of Acts giving? Acts chapter 2. They sold everything they had, brought it together. We don't want to go there, do we? Okay. I, it's just because people want to do that and they don't really know the Bible. And I like Greg comes out then. <laughs> Who knows enough of the Bible will get him in trouble, but he'll use it. Uh, We, we don't break the cycle of ungenerosity by getting more money. Because here's what I know. If you're not generous now, we will just eat it up as we get it. Uh, here's what generosity to me means. I want you to listen to this, and I'm going to give you some practical ideas. To be generous means it needs to be premeditated. What does that mean? premeditated. That means I've thought it out. Okay? In order to be generous, you have to have a plan. Everybody say plan. Let's use the B word. Budget. Say, I'm going to help you today. And you don't even have to buy Dave Ramsey's stuff. It's expensive, but it's a good investment. Anyway. Generosity requires a plan. And I want to say to all of our non-planners, you have a plan. You just don't know it. If you have financial habits, you have a plan. Someone could take my bank statements and your bank statements and average out what we spend our money on and show us what our plan is. Listen, if you don't know what your plan is, it's a bad plan. And if you don't have a plan, you're drifting. You don't have a motor. Right. You're a boat on a river without a motor. Better yet, you're a boat headed toward Niagara Falls without a motor. How many of you know you're headed toward the fall? Uh, if you're drifting, that means something else is controlling my destiny. And if you're without a plan, your life goes this. Consume it, watch this, save if I can, and give to God what's left over. All right. Next, it's premeditated, then it's calculated. Decide ahead of time. Generosity requires a specific amount or percentage, right? You need to know ahead of time, how much am I going to give? It's calculated, right? Angie and I give, give a tithe of 10%. Uh, so say it's Old Testament, whatever. I'm not telling you, I'm not arguing that fact with you today. We do 10 because I'm not letting them outdo me because I believe the gospel is way more powerful than the law was, and I wanted to get around the world. Uh, we, we do a percentage because uh, if we get more, we give more according to that percentage. Uh, generosity says, as I make more, I can give more. And uh, make sure I didn't miss my note here. No, I didn't. Being generous is reciprocating our finances to uh, what was last is now first. I, I tried to, I meant to get a pie today, but I, I didn't. I had my, my grandkids' dog with me this weekend, and I was so in a hurry to get him back home that I forgot I, I was going to stop by Kate Ann to get a pie. 
because I didn't, but I've used pipe high illustration, and I, I used to live my life like this. I'd cut this pie up, I'd give it, 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 and what was left over, normally crumbs from the crust, I'd give to God. That's how I used to live my life. Uh, here's, I've shifted. I, Angie and I have calculated, we've premeditated, this is what we're going to give. And we give that first. Listen to me, kids. We save second, then we spend the rest. Now, my, my daughter's trying to teach my grandkids this. She told me a funny story the other day. I have a middle grandson who's just like me. <laughs> he don't have an alter ego yet. He's just him. But he's just like me, especially as a kid. I love him. They don't understand him. I understand him. His, his name's Isaac, right? So they're trying to institute this principle, give, save, live. And so they've got these three cans. What you're going to do, you're going to give, or you're going to save it, or you're going to just spend it on something else. And he, he, I think he got five bucks, and he said, Mama, I want to I wanna give this. <gasps> Baby, that is so awesome. Who you want to give it to? What you want? He said, Dairy Queen. <laughs> we got a little work to do, but I thought that was awesome. Dairy Queen. So I'm giving it to you. To bless me. Yeah. Anyway. I thought that was good. Look, here's the deal. Let's, let's get practical. Even if you have to take a baby step. You say, I want to be generous, but this whole idea is new to me. Uh, here's, here's, I'm going to give you a starting point here. Uh, dedicated percentage as a starting point, maybe 2%. Couples get together, say, we want to dedicate this. 5%, maybe 10 Maybe God's telling you to go. I know people go above and beyond. They feel like that what God, God has put on their heart. I, I don't know. I, I'm not going to get legalistic with you and tell you, here's what you got to do. Please start somewhere down the path towards being a generous Christ follower. Okay. You can do it any way you want to. Me and Angie, we went on TPCOV. It comes out of, it comes out of our account every week, first thing. That, that way I don't have it because I don't remember. That's what we do, right? We give online. Generous people, I put this into practice the other day. Uh, a lot of these stores now, when you think, so would you like to donate the rest to? You, anybody experience that? Yeah. Uh, Generous people never feel guilty for saying no because they already said yes to something. Okay. Uh, one of the things was given to a local food bank here in town. I said, no. Why? Because I already give to one. They don't feel guilty by saying no to every fundraiser in the city because they've already said yes. They picked a percentage, a time, and a place. It's already there. If you want to give to a fundraiser, you, you know, I will. But you're not going to guilt me into it. I'm not going to feel, oh, God, i got to give my two cents. I'm not going to feel guilty about it because I've already, I'm already generous somewhere. Does that make sense to you? Um, here's how I give them on this basis. Me and Angie, this is what we do. On this basis, here's the principle we go by. What am I grateful for? And what breaks my heart? George, what are you going to give toward? What I'm grateful for and what breaks my heart? You'll have to answer those questions. I can't. But I'll tell you, on our, in our family, I'm grateful for my Savior who paid a debt, who by his death I could not pay. I'm grateful for that. What breaks my heart and what breaks my family's heart, and we're all in this mindset, it's people who have not heard the gospel and are missing out and are going to spend eternity in hell if we don't get this message to them. That breaks my heart. So we give towards something that fulfills that mission. So you give, you save, you live. Guess what? And you have peace. This is what a manager looks like. Managing God's goodness, blessing because... 
he or she realizes, I'm not taking it with me, so it really wasn't mine. And just because it comes to me doesn't mean it all belongs to me. Now, uh, if you're grateful for this local church, you should have a plan for giving to your local church. Okay? It's amazing to me that there's people who enjoy but don't support. All right? Uh, I told you the percentage last week. I'm not going to say that again. I will say this, and you've never heard a pastor say what I'm about to say. But I'm going to say it. If you're not grateful for this local church, find one that you are grateful for and be generous there. I didn't say you had to leave here. I believe in so much that you need to be generous to something that's supporting the cause of God. That if you're not grateful for this one, and you don't have to leave, you can eat the hostess cookies and drink a coffee and bring your kids. I'm not saying that. But I believe in this so much that you need to give somewhere that you are grateful for. That you do believe is supporting the mission. That you do believe that God's blessings is on and he's working through that. If you don't believe that's here, you can leave your body here. But you need to be generous somewhere. Amen. You've never heard a pastor say that. <laughs> well, you're welcome. <laughs> Even if you're an unbeliever listening today, you do not want the local church going away in your society. We've tried to structure this local church in such a way that if this church dissolved tomorrow, the whole world would know it. All right. First Corinthians 3. I don't think I talked, I think I, I ran my mouth ahead of my brain on second service last week. But let me show you something in First Corinthians 3, and I'm going to explain this. And it's been greatly misused, but I'm going to explain this. First Corinthians 3, 11. Did I give that to you? Oh, good. For no one can lay a foundation other that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Everybody say foundation. Say, everything is built on top of a foundation. Christ is first, the, the most important. It's all that he is, he is, Christ is our foundation upon which we build. He is our foundation. All right, good. For no other can lay a foundation other than which is, that which is laid, which is Christ. Jesus. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation, watch this. So, in other words, I have Christ is present in my life. Paul is, Paul is speaking, speaking to save people here, by the way. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, then he gives three more examples, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it, disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. I'm going to explain this to you. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as to fire. What in the world does this mean? What does this mean? This... The day will reveal it is talking about uh, what is referred to as the judgment seat of Christ. Now, you may not know this, but there's two judgments. There's not one. It's, there's the great white throne of judgment, and then there's the judgment seat of Christ. I'll show you this in a minute. The judgment seat of Christ is not for sinners. I knew you would respond that way. The judgment seat of Christ is not to determine one's salvation. Notice verse 15. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved. On that day, at the judgment seat of Christ. It's, it's, and he uses gold, silver, precious stones versus hay, wood, and weeds. What, what, is, what is Paul trying to show us here? 
And, and the judgment is, is as if you had a fire going and you took uh, gold, stones, you know, all these things, you threw them in a fire versus if you put hay, wood, and weeds in there. How many of you know which one's going to burn up? Please just act like you know. I mean, right? I was going to use a bad analogy, but I'm not going to do it. That was Greg. So what does these represent? What is he even talking about? What is Paul talking about that's going to be looked at on this day, this judgment seat of Christ? Uh, Wood, straw, weeds, these represent uh, temporary things, no, no value, right? They're just here today, gone tomorrow, for the now. Uh, how, how many of you have received some inheritance from your family, a precious heirloom of hay? <laughs> oh, my God, my mom gave me some hay. Some of you raised your hand. We are in Southeast Texas. <laughs> right? It has no value. How many of you got some precious stones? And don't raise your hand because somebody might be watching online and going, hmm, I know they're at church right now. I'm going to go get that precious stone. That, all they can see is me sometimes. These things and what he's talking about, gold, silver, precious stones, represent things that have eternal value. They, they just keep on. The judgment seat of Christ is not a time to punish sin. Please hear me. Jesus took the punishment once and for all for those of us who have put our faith in him. The judgment seat of Christ has nothing to do with your salvation. Your salvation was determined the day you put your faith in what he did on the cross. We got some shirts out there that's got the cross, period. People goes, what does cross, period mean? I said, listen to what you're saying. It's the cross, period, nothing else. All right. I mean, you talk about that. This will be a time when we stand shoulder to shoulder with other, other believers and give a report of what we did with what we had. Okay? And he said there will be rewards given accordingly. Okay? Uh, Romans 14, 10. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? There's a key word, brother. For we all will stand before the judgment seat of God. Now, he's talking to church folk. Church folk, right? The Greek word for judgment seat is a word called bema, B-E-M-A. What does that mean? A bema was a raised platform, right? Uh, it, was, it was where a judge would set at an athletic event, which many times was running and different things in, in, that, in that time, uh, their job was not to punish the athlete. The Bama seat, his job was to uh, reward. Reward. That's what his point. He said hi. He got to see who crossed the line. He gave out rewards according to, you with me? The best we can tell, the best we can tell is uh, the reward will be crowns. The best we can tell. I'm, I'm not, nobody can give 100% on that. 2 Timothy 4.8. Uh, these will be given at the Bema, judgment seat of Christ, right after the rapture of the church. And there are people going to disagree. They don't believe in the rapture. Some believe in the rapture. Some mid-trib. I, 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 I'm not, I, again, we're not two dogs on a tire today. Okay, I don't know about all that. But what he is saying is this. This is not talking about salvation. He said the man will be saved, but will not get his reward. According to what he did by what he had on earth. Now, I would not be worth my Wait and salt if I didn't tell you this stuff. Okay. I, I didn't make this up. I don't know what the reward is. I want it. Amen. If it's a crown, a mansion on a golf course, <laughs> a pond full of fish, 
are just hanging out with Jesus. But, but my hanging out with Jesus was taken care of years ago. You can't, because people will preach this wrong. And they will use this as a works-based salvation. It's not what he's talking about. He said the man's going to be saved. This is not a time to figure out your salvation. The great white throne of judgment are for those who have not put their faith in Christ. They will stand before God and they will be cast into the sea, the, the lake of fire forever. That's what the great white, this is, this is for us. The judgment seat of Christ, the Bama seat is for us. You find both of them. And that's when we get our rewards for what we did with what we had. And I want him to say to George and Angie, well done. You were faithful. I, faithful, yeah, yeah. You, you are faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many. Maybe that's a reward. I don't know. But I don't want you ruling me. I want to rule you. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. That was bad. See, he keeps popping up. He's there. That'll be next week's message. Uh, two things. I want you to see God's blessing while on earth. And I want God's reward for all of us in the next. Okay. Generosity is not an amount. Generosity is a hard issue. But generous people set an amount. And you've got to live. This is just good budgeting. It's good, but if you don't live by a budget, you're in trouble. Unless you make zillions, and then it don't matter. But I don't know if anybody does that. If you do, it's just do lunch. <laughs> good. I, I love you to death. Uh, and I love the work of the Lord. I love the kingdom of God. I love Jesus what he did for me that I couldn't do for myself. I love him. And, and I want everybody to have a shot at getting out of this mess. And it's going to take the generosity of Christians with your time, your talent. There's people who are talented through the nose and you're just sitting on it like a dog on a milk bone. Right? And the resources God has blessed us with. We're going to continue to reach the world. That is my heart. You know that. I'm probably an evangelist at heart. I'm not a good discipler. I'm a catcher. But you can't disciple without me because you, you can't disciple what you can call all my disciple people. Right? It takes both. You've got to catch them, disciple them. And there's people in here that are great at that. That's their heart. My job's always been net. Throw the net and just get them in. I, I didn't make me. God did. And that's why we're all important. We're all gifted in a certain way. Let's be generous with our gifts of all kinds and see what God will do. He will bless you. Listen to me. He will bless you on this earth. I'm not being a hen in you or a crefro dollar or another ten that need to come forward and repent. I'm just being honest with you. Old country boy redneck who put, it, put God through the test and I know what he can do. That's all I am. I'm just, that's, I'm just old country redneck. I don't have a PhD. I got ADD. <laughs> right? But I look back on my life and go, look what the Lord has done. Right? There was times when I could give more. There was times when I was given a crumb because that's all I had. But he took it and he blessed it. And I want everybody to understand that in your life. Father, thank you today for all these great people who are turning their face toward you and following you and want to see you do great things in their lives and in the kingdom. I pray your blessings on us as we bless you. Bless us. Show, prove, prove yourself, God. As we, right here in this local community, reach the world, right? You use our generosity to reach the world. People around the world right now are tuned in, right, because you are using our generosity. Heaven's going to be a great reunion time when people come up to us and say, thank you. You don't know me, but I was blessed because of you. I heard the gospel because of you. I heard about Jesus who paid a price because of you. Thank you. 
Lord, we want to hear that. We want to hear you say, well done, as you give us our reward on that great day. We love you today. We thank you. Be with us this week. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen.